one, are you ready? Ready! Camera two? All set. Camera three? I don't even want to use this intro, I don't even have cameras on this show. So back in the olden days when I watched television, which was a thing people used to do, I spent quite a bit staring at the screen waiting for something that I actually wanted to watch. As such, I consumed hours upon hours of things of only tangential interest to me. Things like the single season of Carpoolers, <laughs> Exhibit bringing untold suffering and lack of taste to fortunate owners who wanted it and possibly flipped that immediately on eBay afterwards. On the mornings, of course, I watched The Price is Right, further proving that it is not only the elderly and stone college students that watch that. And somewhere amongst all of this, I also watch quite a lot of Scrubs. Scrubs is a good show. It gets very weird on the later seasons and, with the best will in the world, I can see why diehard fans act like the final season didn't exist. But most episodes I watch had a lovely blend of good comedy and serious moments. It created at least one thing that's still used today and that most kids who see it will have no idea when it comes from. And then, of course, are the performances. I could spend a minute or so praising the acting chops of Neil Flynn, Sarah Chalk and Donald Faison, as well as trying to figure out how Bill Lawrence managed to get JD through the show with a believable character arc, despite clearly losing his grip on sanity as the show went on. However, the reason I brought this up was the real start of the show, John C. McGinley as Perry Cox. McGinley has that unnatural quality some actors do, in which they kinda play an exaggerated version of themselves on every role they have, and yet they elevate both themselves and the world surrounding them. Your Christopher Walkens, Nicolas Cage's and Sean Connery's brought that to an art form, but that's only because we don't see nearly enough of John C. And I am here to correct this. And what better way to do this than going to his big screen cinematic debut, 1986's Sweet Liberty. Actually, pretty much anything else would have been a better entry into this. Nobody remembers this movie and it seems to have elicited a solid meh from the audience and critics alike. Quite how it managed to get a Blu-ray release is beyond me. However, it does showcase the fundamentals of the John C. performance signature style, so I thought we should take a look. The movie stars Alan Alda, who also wrote and directed it. In case you don't know, it means we're dealing with Hollywood royalty here. Alan Alda is best known for playing Captain Hawkeye Pierce on MASH, a groundbreaking sitcom, although the term sitcom seems kinda limiting to describe this show, as well as a monumental disservice to all of the effort that went into it. MASH still holds the record for the most viewed broadcast in television history. When its finale was broadcast in 1983, 77 out of 100 TVs that were switched on in the United States were tuned to it. It also gave Alda 5 of his 6 Emmys and his 3 awards from the Directors Guild of America. This is not getting into his golden gloves or the fact that he has more doctors than most families. The point that I am trying to make here is, we can place the blame of everything we're about to see squarely on him. He plays one of those Pulitzer winning history professors that give an hour of class a week and have infinite time to do whatever it is that takes their fancy today. I always hated those, though to be fair to them, I could have just stopped applying as a teaching assistant. And besides, he seems to have his hands full with things. He's on an off again, non again relationship with his kinda sort of girlfriend and fellow divorcee Gretchen, played by Daisy Hillbolt. He also has to deal with his aging mother, who seems to be locked in a battle for her house with Say and also wants to find an old flame of hers to move in. He was supposed to have some bit of joy in his life. After all, he's realized the dream of every aspiring writer, to have his book option into a movie which was then modified into what seems to be a summer flick set in the middle of the Civil War. And I guess at the time that seemed hilarious, but we live in the post-Hamilton world so it's not completely out of the question. That's the basic gist of the plot, or should I say plots, because the main issue with this movie is not the acting or the directing, it's that Alda apparently decided that he needed to tell a half dozen stories in 88 minutes. Trying to save his book from becoming the 80s equivalent of the last Airbender movie is just the main one, so let's get through that one real quick. Our screenwriter for this movie is Stanley Gould, played by the late Bob Hoskins. He apparently liked the book so much that he turned it into a screenplay, which then got railroaded into something completely different. This is a piece of shit, of course it is! I hate it! Dismayed at the fat turkey that the movie is going to become, he asks Alda for help. Michael, tell me I'm yours. What choice have I got? None. You're mine. I love you. Skeptical at first, he decides screw it after a meeting with a director played by Saul Rubinek. With me on everything you do. Let me see. You really don't like the love story. I hate it. I want it out. And you don't like the dialogue. It's it's all got to be changed. Okay. 
We just had a consultation. Nice talking to you. Charlie, come here. I thought that room was going to be green. Green is a funny color. I want all of it green. Yeah, that gives him all the motivation he needs to try and make the movie closer to his book. And he works with Stanley to achieve it. With both of them stonewalled from any actual segments, Stanley quickly realizes that the only way in is through the leads of the movie, Elliot James and Faith Healy, played by Michael Caine and Michelle Pfeiffer. These two are by far the best characters of the entire movie. Caine plays the British cat he was always born to play, in Here Are Better and Who's Now Into Films, and... He has a thing for fucking on women who ain't his wife. And Michelle Pfeiffer playing a method actress with whom Alda falls in love in another subplot. They make merry over her fascination with the journal of the character she's portraying, and Alda gives both of them revised scripts so they can take them to the director and fight about it. I worry that I am making it sound like all of this goes somewhere, but let me assure you, it doesn't. Nothing on the movie really matters. For example, Alda's mother. She's degenerating to the point that she doesn't eat food and lets it over the TV for 24 hours and cannot figure out the door lock. She calls for her son to find her old flame. This poor man wants to be so far away from her that he changed his phone number, his address and even his name. After she suffers a stroke and with some prodding from Christine, she goes to check up on him to find that he's married. I didn't know you were married. Oh yeah. I've been married for 40 years. When is she going to leave us alone? We moved to another town, we pulled out the telephone. What more can we do? Where does this go? Nowhere. You get this. He said he thinks of you every day. He, he keeps your picture by his bed. He dreams about you. He does. And that's it. Lillian Gilch, who plays that role, was in movies since people were scared that the train on the screen was going to run them over, so she deserved a better arc than that. Then again, she hooks up with Bob Hoskins at the end in some footage that I don't have because this movie is so cursed that my Blu-ray got lost in the mail. Then there's also Elliot's wife, who seems to be completely aware of her husband's ways and randomly drops on him on set. You expect some catfights or something out of it, but nothing comes up from it apart from this. Give me your lips. And this. Or Alda complaining that Gretchen needs some the best. Ah, ah, I've been bitten. Something bit me. <laughs> what the hell are you doing with dangerous implements in bed? I was living together. A year is a long time. There would be a certain amount of sewing, yeah. but not in bed. Because apparently that was such an important plot point that it needed to carry throughout the entire film. Or how about the reason I even decided to sit through this whole thing? John C.'s story arc. He plays Floyd, a member of the local branch of Civil War reenactors who recreate the Battle of Cowpens every year. John C. is particularly fond of his own little trick. This is a spawn too. Yeah, I'm pole ball with it. Listen to the enunciation. Look at that facial expression. This man will give us 40 years of absolute excellence. So he shows up in one cameo or another across the entire film until the final scene when Alda, finally tired of all the script bullshit and empowered by a hundred men in Civil War uniform, finally snaps at the director. Which is odd. The movie seemed to imply that the thing with the covert script changes was working well. But anyway. They don't care if the hats are on wrong or the buttons are on the wrong sleeve. They just want to have fun. Now get the hell over to that house or get the hell off my set. Yeah, he's about to get a lesson in loopholes and malicious compliance. The shooting goes to shit, as they recreate the battle accurately and John C. gets the chance to shine. I was just in a, a, a Broadway play that opened, in, it opened on a Thursday and closed on a Saturday. Um, and so the play closed, I broke up with my girlfriend, and then all of a sudden the agent sends you a script and says that Alan Alda would like to see you. And I'm like, Alan Alda doesn't know me from a guy at the post office. I had read the script. And uh, a central component was my character had to pole vault over some cannons. And easy. so Alan Sounds goes, easy. can you pole vault? And like any actor, I'm just like, you could ask me if I do root canal surgery. I would have gone like, <laughs> look, I was just in a play that opened and closed in 72 hours. And my girlfriend dumped me. I can do, I, we can do what do you want me to do? 
The next day, Alan Alda picked me up in a limo, and we went up to West Point, and go up to a cannon, and it was about eight feet high, and Alan said, do you think you could get over this? And I said, well, well, yeah, yeah. And so I did what I have seen track athletes do my whole life. I just did my steps backwards away from the cannon, and then I pantomimed going up to the cannon and pole vaulting over. Uh, and, and then I called my high school track coach out in Jersey, and I had about seven weeks to get ready, and I learned how to pole vault. And because the director has been saying that nudity sells throughout the entire movie... So he gets taught a lesson, right? I just want to tell you, I'm sorry, I hope I didn't, I hope I didn't ruin things for you yesterday. What are you talking about, the battle scene? Yeah. Nah. Are you kidding? Michael, I shot it with six cameras, I can put it together any way I want. It'll be terrific. Motherfucking hey, mutt! You, come you come fucking come piece of shit! See? Nothing. Nobody learns anything and all of the conflicts amount to nothing. This movie is of no importance, which is fine. Except that at the very least an entertaining movie has to have some stakes somewhere. In here, Alda has already been paid his option, so has the screenwriter, so have the actors. Even if the movie bombs they'll get paid, and the movie implies that they were chosen precisely because their names mean people will go see it, so... You know, they may have a bit of a stumble in their careers, but that's it if they have a good agent. And then of course Alda and Kinda Sorta Girlfriend get together again, because I guess that's what the movie was all about. And so the movie ends with the movie within a movie being released, apparently without any of the notes from Alda on the script, everyone loving the premiere, again, no footage of that, and nobody too upset about anything anymore. Not even me, because even though this movie was by and large a waste of bandwidth, it did give us Johnny C on the big screen, and the best was yet to come. However, I am not just going to leave you with that, because although nobody learned the lesson within the movie, I could get one from it. Next time I'm asking for script approval. See you next time, everyone.